We are, a, we are a center of education and learning. Learning is both classroom work, which you saw with our Bullet Scholar, and also it's uh, research. When students do research, then they learn things. They learn uh, how to handle data sets and analyze data and tackle problems. And then when you go on to the professional sphere, you, you do the same thing. And sometimes you work on things in a lab, and sometimes you work on things very far away. Our current uh, bullet speaker, bullet lecturer, is Dr. Candice Hansen. So Candy is from California. She did her bachelor's degree at uh, Fullerton State. And then she did a little bit of uh, graduate school in Arizona and then went on to the Jet Propulsion Lab, where for 10 years she labored with a bachelor's because she could. And that's very good. And that was with, uh, she's been affiliated with a number of space uh, projects and space missions over the years. She then did her PhD at UCLA and uh, eventually spent a couple of years at the German Space Center in Oberpfaffenhausen. Okay. Oberpfaffenhofen. Oberpfaffenhofen, which is in a suburb. <laughs> Oberpfaff Oberpfaffenhofen. Okay, I want to say this correctly. We do have some native speakers here in suburban Munich. And then came back. She's been associated with missions to Mars and to Saturn and to Jupiter. And in particular, she has been responsible for JunoCam which is an, an optical camera on the Juno probe to Jupiter, which arrived last year. Just to give you some appreciation, the space probes to the outer solar system have to be proposed for, with a, their NASA gives calls for, for proposals, for programs, and they have several stages, phase A, phase B, phase C and D, and so on. And then after a, after a proposal is funded, which can take several years and several tries, then you have to build it, which takes several more years, then you have to launch it, which is white knuckle time, and then it has to arrive at its destination, which can take five or 10 years or so. And so this becomes the work of a career to, uh, to plan, build, launch, fly, and execute, and then analyze the data for a space probe. And she's bringing us some of the finished products now from the Juno Cam. She's going to tell us about uh, the first public outreach camera flown to the outer solar system. And uh, we look forward to results. Welcome to Dr. Candy Hansen. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to come. And um, you've been staring at my opening slide for a while, so <laughs> I'm gonna move on to the next one. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, just a little outline of where we're headed in the next hour or less. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit of background about Jupiter and its rings and its moons, just in case you might, anybody have forgotten. Um, and then I'll move into what's the real topic of tonight's talk, which is JunoCam. And there's two things about JunoCam that are new. First is the perspective over Jupiter's poles, but secondly, and really more importantly, is the way that we have included the public in the way that we do business. Uh, so let me start with a little bit of a quick review. Um, there are eight planets in our solar system. Everybody knows Pluto got demoted, very sad. Um, so. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are what we call terrestrial planets. They have solid surfaces. The next four, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, are what we call <coughs> gas giants. So what you're looking at when you look at these planets are atmospheres, thick atmospheres. We don't even know if there's a solid core on the inside. Jupiter, of course, is the largest uh, planet in our solar system, and uh, the atmosphere is composed of hydrogen and helium, and you can see that it's kind of got these latitudinal stripes, and we call those belts and zones. The belts are the dark orangey brown, and the zones are the, the bright white clouds. And um, over here is the great red spot, and there's the Earth. So you get an idea of just how giant this giant planet is. So the first spacecraft to fly by Jupiter were the pioneers, and that was in the early 1970s. 
Uh, next, we had Voyager 1 and 2 flying by uh, in the early 80s. Uh, and then there were a couple of spacecraft that flew by on their way to somewhere else, in, in actually including the Voyagers. Um, Ulysses studied the sun. Cassini flew by on its way to Saturn. New Horizons flew by on its way to Pluto. But each spacecraft collected data along the way. Uh, the first orbiter around Jupiter was Galileo, named after the famous astronomer. And, um, and now we have Juno. So I'm going to show you just a few little snippets of results from these spacecraft, and then we'll start talking about Juno. Did you, did you catch that movie? I'm actually going to play it again, but it'll be equally fast. Um, so Voyager, we were talking just before uh, this started about how little we knew before Voyager. And when Voyager flew by, it literally opened up worlds. And so, for example, we discovered volcanoes on Io. Um, we d imaged, for the first time, Jupiter's ring. And, oh my gosh, Saturn's not the only planet with rings. That was a big surprise. Okay, I'm going to play the movie again, and it's going to go fast again. But what this is, is as we were on approach, we were taking pictures um, with Voyager and assembling it into time lapse. And so from that, we got to a, where we could understand a lot about the atmospheric dynamics. Here's an easier version to watch because it doesn't go quite as fast. This is the Cassini movie. Uh, so when Cassini was on approach, it also took one of these time-lapse uh, movies. And you can see the belts and the zones. The winds go different directions. You can see the great red spot churning away. And, uh, and so this was really our state of knowledge in, in a five-minute nutshell. Um, actually, one more slide. Um, and uh, before Juno. And I want to point out one thing that's very important. All of these spacecraft flew by or <laughs> orbited in Jupiter's equatorial plane. And so we knew almost nothing about Jupiter's poles. OK, so here's the great red spot. It's shrinking. It's even gotten smaller since these pictures were taken. But you can see in 1995, using these lines to just guide your eye, you can see how wide it was in 1995. And it's been steadily getting smaller. We've never actually seen that before. So that's very puzzling. Even though this talk is really about Jupiter, it would be just tragic of me not to say anything about the four big moons. And so uh, I am going to say a bit about uh, the four Galilean satellites. And they were mostly studied in detail with the Galileo orbiter. The Galilean satellites, of course, obviously were named after Galileo. He was the one that discovered these moons. And I think probably all of us have, even if we're not astronomers or physics majors or anything, we all know how profound Galileo's discovery of the moons in orbit around Jupiter was to um, upending the conventional wisdom of his day, which was that everything rotated around the Earth. And so um, Galileo's important. These moons are incredibly important as well. But we didn't realize how really incredibly interesting they were. <laughs> we just knew they were important you know, in a, uh, that context. But um, here they are. Uh, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And um, all of them except Europa are larger than our own moon, Earth's moon. Um, these three have icy surfaces. Uh, Io does not. And the reason for that is all those volcanoes. It probably did have water ice at some point. But now there are volcanoes going off constantly. At any given moment in time, there are probably 10 different volcanoes erupting. Uh, and here you can see a lava flow that was uh, actually uh, imaged by the camera on Galileo. Galileo, the spacecraft. <laughs> okay. 
Europa is fascinating because we 